Welcome. Okay, so break the cost performance trade off by business model innovation. Now you have that set up and you test your business model and you want to get it going. What can you do then? Well, start by trying to get everything aligned, right? So make growth a really, really explicit goal for everybody. Everybody should know that the priority here is growth. It's the highest priority we have, except from creating value for our customers and, and you know, behave in an ethical manner. Those are sort of hygiene criteria, but then it's all about growth. And then you set up this business model that we talked about. We try to set up that, try that in the market, get it validated, it works. And then we try to repeat do the same thing over and over again and expand it, optimize it and repeating it to learn more. So we leverage our business model, not inventing new things, going in other directions. Once we identify the value proposition, the market and the business model, we should really focus on doing that and doing that more, 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 better, 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 better. And we can see that in, in all these growing companies. And as, as you might remember from the industry disruption session, often we have an unbundled value proposition early on. We do one thing and we do that with some focus and we'll grow in that thing. Another thing that really is worth taking into account is to do the business growth by engaging your own users, your own customers and making them ambassadors for your products and services, you know, and this is reflected in viral marketing ideas. A satisfied customer is always a much better and more credible promoter of you and your business than you can be yourself by doing advertising and commercials and all that, you know. I mean, of course, I'll say my own products are good, but if someone else says it, it's just so much stronger. So support that, make it easy for your customers to recommend your product service. Encourage them to do unboxing videos, share with friends, give the friend a discount. You can get a discount if you have a friend that starts buying from us also. Lower the barriers to entry as much as possible. It should be easy to try it. it should be easy to get out. So it should be like a low risk feeling. Use humor, use likability a humorous commercial, or even if a founder is active as a podcaster or a YouTuber and so on, or people in the company, that spreads a lot. And another way that you can support this very effectively is to use influencers. That might cost you a little bit, but there's firms today that you can contact online that are specialized in linking your product and service to the right influencers and get you promoted in their channels. Even if it's clear that it's paid, at least it's someone else that believes in it enough to, to stand there and recommend it. Or you can send it to them and say, hey, uh, we think you might like this one, but if you don't, we really would like to know. Please try it and feel free to review it in your channel. Okay, so you have the growth now. You, you have your nice product, you have your nice business model. It's supported by a large crowd of people that helps push your sales and the attention into this business model that also is, you know, nicely frictionless and self-propelling. But then what happened? Well, maybe it all stops, you know, growth stops. The hockey stick that you start to see, it's broken. And this is a huge cause of failure for technology-based companies, especially if they've been struggling for some time, they get growth going, they get the revenues going, and they go and ask for capital. And then after they get that, it's, it's just not really expanding anymore. And we call that being stuck in the chasm. And the idea is that for innovative products, 
And innovative in this context means that the, the customer has to learn something to be able to use them. It's different from what they're used to. It's different from the market alternative that they have, that they are doing today. For innovative products, we have to consider the technology adoption cycle. And we have these tech enthusiasts in the beginning. They are like innovators themselves. They would like your product and service if it's new because they're interested in tech. They even don't mind so much that it's full of bugs and problems. They might even help you to solve those and not give you recommendations on how to improve your software and so on. Really nice. And then you have early adopters. That's a little bit larger group of companies. This model is based on B2B sales, but they're a little bit larger group that like to have the latest stuff, uh, but they're not so technically interested that they're willing to compensate with it working. It has to work, you know. So willing to be a little bit flexible if we can see an advantage. And then we have the big market, you know, this, these two blocks, the pragmatists and the conservatives, they are 70% of the market. So that's where the hockey stick happens. These are companies that are not so willing to accept a product or service that requires adaptation. They want it to work, first of all, and they want it to be compatible with how they're doing things, because otherwise they have to change a lot of other things and be really annoying and problematic for them. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about the value delta. These main market companies, they want you to add things to your products so it works without them having to change a lot. And then we have the conservatives. They are even, even more demanding. And once you have the conservatives, so you have the S-curve, right? That's just the integration of this curve. We have the S-curve and we have the conservatives that really don't want to change unless almost everybody else is doing things the new way and we'll be falling behind. We'll have a disadvantage. Once you have most of them, you more or less exhausted the growth potential of the market. Problem here is that pragmatists listen to recommendations from other companies, but only from other pragmatists. For them, pioneers are people with arrows in the back, someone said. But to come over this chasm, you need to create what's called a, a complete product. So this is where you need to bundle in things to your value propositions in terms of systems, learning, guarantees, spare parts, compatibility, service, all sorts of things. It's what's called a whole product. But sometimes we don't have a chasm, right? There was no chasm for Facebook. Klarna, did they have a CASP? Maybe, maybe not. Some of these have a CASP, some have not. So it's especially in the situation when we're trying to do something for a company, but they have an old solution, the market alternative. And in Facebook case, you know, nobody had a Facebook. Maybe you had a messenger service or something, but the Facebook thing was, was new and they didn't take, it didn't take you away from some other kind of social media that you might have been using. It was just another thing coming that filled the space that was empty. Yeah, so the paradox is resolved by, is it the B2B situation? If not, you might not need to go through the cast. And is there an existing market alternative? It's just another way of looking at this value delta. So it's a bit of a challenge to sell to companies. This is part of it. Another part is that people that buy for companies are really risk averse. Okay, so tough situation when you realize that you have a chasm, right? I mean, you can, you can solve that beforehand if you analyze it. So yeah, it seems to happen when we have the function that we're trying to deliver is already existing in the ecosystem through a market alternative. And we're not really trying to change the ecosystem. We sell the companies, they'll still do what they're already doing in, uh, in terms of the relationships between suppliers and customers and complementers. That all stays the same. So uh, this is the situation with companies like Salesforce that has customer resource management 
they put this activity onto platform instead of you running it yourself in your own solutions. The ecosystem roles are not changed and the function was there and we do it, but with a better solution. We could also, of course, come to the ecosystem with a new function, right? And we talked about this already. It's when we want to do things differently in the ecosystem, but each of us is going to keep the roles that we have, but we see that a change is needed in terms of technology applied or, you know, combining our different assets so we can offer new services. It's a new function that we are delivering or it's a new function in the ecosystem even that we are co-using. And that would be when we use collaborative innovation. So ecosystem change. Implementing that is not something that one actor can do alone, but we can do it together. We have to have collaborative innovation. We're still doing our own things, but we can do it better with this new function. Actors that has served as examples here is like Bluetooth, which was agreeing on a standard for short range mobile communication. Uh, sorry, short range and wireless communication. Huawei, a company that didn't have so much access to, to capital for R&D and so on. So they had to collaborate with customers and with uh, local actors and so on and build up different services, telecom capabilities in, in a more cooperative mode of innovation. Of course, it could also be that there is a new function but the ecosystem is changed. In one case is when there is no ecosystem at all and it's formed by us providing a new function. So examples here could be companies like Facebook. They could come in, offer a new service, grow on the market. There was no real competition there. It really didn't take customers away from somebody else or nobody else was forced to change anything. It was, let's say, a virgin market, an, an open, uncontested space. And then, of course, there is the case when there is an ecosystem there, but we do the function they are already doing. And we have the taxi example with Uber. There's already taxi companies providing taxi service. They do it in a different, radically better way. Well, what happens is that we might disrupt the system. We provide one of this ecosystem's function, but there is inefficiencies in the ecosystem. So it can be done in a radically better way. And the case here are like Skype and Spotify. Both of them competed with established large companies through an ecosystem that was very stable and had been around for a long time. But they changed it into a platform model. And with the platform, it got disruptive because it was so easy for customers to change. In the end, of course, the technology gets better and the new entrants will take over the old incumbents. So four situations. So you don't maybe, no, you don't have a CASP. Sometimes you have. If you go in to an ecosystem and do something they do, you can either sell it to them and they get to keep their roles. But if you take over their roles, it will restructure the value network. The value structure will have most of the functions, but it will be drawn in a new way. The new actors will be fewer and relying on more effective asset usage. And the value network will be rearranged and a few thrown out most of the time. We have a business model that we tried and it seems to work. We start up. Then when it, we see it works, we have a value proposition that's attractive, a market that is large. Don't innovate, dig where you stand and become really obsessive now in pushing sales, 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 drive this revenue line, deliver more, repeat and learn and improve. And you go from startup into a fast growing startup. So it's really all about exploitation. Companies need to explore and exploit. Exploring is looking, sensing, getting inspiration, learning and so on. And exploiting is really to use the things we know that we learned and using that for production as effectively as we possibly can. And then maybe you can start to enjoy these ecosystem effects 
adjacent factors that notice that here is some activity happening that is good, it will support you. But to even get here, we also need to think about having ensured that the complementary innovations that is needed for customers to enjoy your value proposition are there and that all the actors that could get in the way or resist our entry into the market are also benefiting from our innovations. Then we get their support instead and it pushes up here and then we improve more and more and maybe we can have an international success and get that billion dollar valuation which means that we have a unicorn kind of status.